Kenya is an important source of roses and capsicum crops to the European market. The country supplies one-third of all roses sold in the EU. However, this market is under threat since 2018 when the European Commission for Plant Health issued a new phytosanitary requirement declaring the false codling moth as one of the quarantine pests found in sub-Saharan Africa, affecting roses and capsicum crops. Dr. Isaac Masharia, the General Manager Phytosanitary Services at KEFIS, puts this into perspective. The EU uh, indicated to us that this was a quarantine pest and they required all products coming from Kenya to be free from this pest. This significantly affected our particular roses where we had had a lot of interceptions and what happened for the product intercepted they actually destroyed and that is a loss to Kenya. According to statistics from the Kenya Plant Health Inspectorate Service, there were 37 interceptions on Kenyan roses in 2018, 39 in 2019 and 33 in 2020. Elizabeth Kimani in charge of quality control and the general manager at Cyan Flowers explains why. Before 2018, the sampling was done at 1%, but it has since grown up to 10% by end of 2020. Um, there's also a risk that if this, the problem of FCM continues, the percent might increase to 25 or even up to 100%. So it's a real threat for the Kenyan flower industry. But what do we know about the false codling moth? It has four stages in its life cycle, namely the egg, the larva, the pupa, and the adult moth. The false codling moth, also known by its scientific name as Tomatotibia leucotreta, is an indigenous pest that is predominantly found in sub-Saharan Africa. It is present in all the roses and capsicum growing areas of Kenya. It is an important economic pest and a quarantine pest with zero tolerance by the European Union. But how can one identify the false codling moth in their production farms? Wesley Cheruyot, the training manager at Real IPM, provides us with the characteristics. It has a complete metamorphosis, that is a life cycle, that is the egg, larvae, pupae and adult. The eggs are normally uh, whitish and uh, oval in shape and um, when they are almost hatching they turn red in color. When it hatches it moves to the second step, that is the larvae and under the larvae there are five instars. The characteristics of the first four instars is that they have a creamish to white dish body and they have um, a brownish to dark head. And for the fifth insta, the body is pinkish in color and the head is also uh, darkish in color. So all the instas of the false codling moth have four pro legs on the underside of their larvae stage. Pupae stage, uh, they are all cream in color and um, the female one has a larger um, uh, pupae than the male one. Some of the characteristics of an adult male and female FCM include two white dots on the forewings, a question mark sign on the forewings that is dark in color, and both have a hump at the back. Management of FCM in roses must involve an integrated approach in all stages of the value chain and through training of all stakeholders. There are several effective FCM control methods that are used when producing flowers. Namely, monitoring by use of pheromone traps and scouting, cultural control methods, physical control methods, biological control, and chemical control methods. As a producer, it is important that you eliminate presence of those plants like beans, avocado trees, and uh, even coffee plants, and any other host plant that can be a source 
of this particular pest. The second uh, option that you have as a grower is using nets, which are barriers that prevent that prevents entry of these particular moths into your farm. The third option that you need to undertake as a grower is ensuring that you have well-trained scouts that can easily identify the pest once it is in your farm. And this can be identified through using such things as pheromone traps for monitoring purposes. Another thing that is important for growers is that they need uh, to ensure that they develop rapid alert systems that every other person that is working within the farm is aware in one way or another of uh, how the pest look like. To ensure that you have printed colored um, life cycle stages of this particular FCM to ensure that they are conversant with it so that any other time through this rapid alert system whenever an employee notices a uh, presence of this pest they are capable of notifying the management and the people responsible for controlling this particular pest early enough so that we can be able to handle this pest on a timely basis. But how can producers prevent FCM from getting into the greenhouses? Linda Murungi, an experienced post-harvest manager at Sian Flowers, explains this in details. In order to ensure that the pest does not enter into the site, that is the greenhouse and the park houses, uh, the first step is physical control whereby we do the physical trapping of the pest. We also monitor the opening and closing of the curtains and the ventilation because we know that uh, the pest is highly active at night. It's very nocturnal. Uh, step two, uh, which is also a very critical step, is a lot of awareness and training of the staff so that uh, they know how to do the pest identification and also the pest control in their areas. For effective use of pheromone traps in your farm, farmers must consider the following aspects when placing them. Place the traps above the crop. Position the traps by aligning them to the windward side of the crop. Replace the traps following the manufacturer's instructions. Avoid contaminating the traps. And use the traps at the rate of 4 per hectare, among others. In post-harvest management techniques of FCM, Flower producers are urged to do the following. Train all employees on FCM identification and communication. Display identification posters of FCM in the parkhouse area. Quarantine any plants with FCM or damage. Carry out plastic solarization for any affected flowers and stems, as Elizabeth Kimani explains. We have identified critical control points for post-harvest control, uh, where we make sure that all our employees that are involved in the processing or in the harvesting of the flowers are properly trained to identify the pest and to take mitigation measures. So we have uh, the first control point in the greenhouse where all the harvesters must check the flowers after harvesting to just make sure that there is no false codling moth in the flowers. So that one we call it like the first control point and the most effective because uh, when you look at the harvesters, they handle each and every stem, they have time and they are not under pressure as opposed to uh, delegating this responsibility to the pack house. So we also have the second control point which is at the intake where we have uh, also extensive checks uh, but at that point we have a sampling method and the sampling is based on either the sighting or the presence of the pest from the greenhouse where the flowers are coming from. So we have a robust communication between the production and the post-harvest teams where the production team will inform the pack house if they have sighted the, the first codling moth in the greenhouse so that when the flowers get into the pack house, they are given more attention and sometimes we even do up to 100% check just to make sure that we are, we are clean. After the intake, we also have just before grading where we have sorters who just go through again to make sure that in case the, the intake quality controller has missed uh, the pest, it can also be removed from there. Then we have the, the line or the team quality controllers and the, the bunchers who are also well trained to identify and remove. And then eventually we have the final sampling at the end of the grading where we have a final quality controller 
who samples the finished boxes and goes through them just like what Kefis would do, just to act as, as, a, as a final control point to make sure that we are really careful and sure that we have checked through the systems. So I would say systems approach has really helped because sometimes it's difficult to eradicate the pest from the field or the, the time between when you cite a pest and the time you're able to completely eradicate it, there's, there's a lot of time. So you need to also combine that with systems approach. Capsicum produce for export has also been affected by the EU requirement because of the presence of FCM. Apollo Owar, the chairman of FPIC, explains more. Chile is one of the hosts of this pest, so we have to grow the chilies under very well controlled environment to isolate and to remove, to keep this pest away from our crops. For capsicum, we require them to produce them under pest-free places of production and therefore they need to establish a greenhouse and from the greenhouse be able to trap and maintain uh, areas that are free from that particular pest. According to statistics from Kefis, capsicum produced from Kenya destined for the EU market had 10 interceptions in 2018, 14 in 2019 and 13 in 2020. This had a huge impact on Kenyan growers. Initially we had a significant high number of capsicum growers I think over 30 of them growing capsicum for export to the EU. When we introduced the new measures in 2018, uh, we reduced this number to only four. Only four uh, capsicum growers were able to meet the requirements and then therefore all the others had to drop export of capsicum. We didn't allow them to ship. But after that, um, different companies have put in structures and systems and currently we have about 25 companies that are being able to export capsicum from Kenya. Frank Obure, the general manager at Triple A Growers, shares with us the challenges they are facing due to the EU requirements on FCM. The cost of production has gone up because we have to look at alternative ways of controlling the pest besides the chemicals. So that has driven the growing cost in the field and also the fact that the chilies must be grown in a, in a covered area of production. So that in itself has driven the cost of putting up greenhouses for growing the chilies. Uh, post harvest, we still have to fumigate the chilies and fumigation is also an extra cost um, to the business because we are engaging a service provider to do that for us. Uh, the fumigation process is also leading to a significant waste because of the conditions. So for every 100 kilos of chilies we fumigate, we lose about 40 kilos. So in essence, it is food loss of about 40% during the fumigation process. But what are the key important protective measures that producers of capsicum in Kenya should put in place to ensure that FCM is not present in exported produce? First, all farmers growing capsicum for export must be registered by CAFIS. Farmers should monitor their fields for FCM and when necessary, treatments should be applied. Records of all monitoring and control operations must be kept, including date, reason for applying pesticides, product applied, rate used and pre-harvest interval. These records must be shared with CAFIS for inspection. Peppers should be inspected before they leave the farm. If even a single fruit with a larva is found, sale to an exporter should be stopped. During transport to the packhouse, batches from individual farms or plots must be labeled and kept separate. In the packhouse, each individual batch of peppers must be examined Batches must be kept separate until they have been inspected and found to be clean. And only then can they be packed for shipment. The presence of even a single larva in a batch means the batch must not be exported. At the airport, phytosanitary inspectors must carry out official inspections and issue a phytosanitary certificate only if there is zero presence of larvae or no signs of infestations on the peppers. 
Each inspection involves a thorough visual examination of the consignment and destructive dissection of approximately one fruit in every 100. Small samples should have at least five peppers cut open for assessment. In post-harvest management, the following measures must be implemented to prevent infestation and reduce the chances of infested peppers reaching the packhouse. Ensure all operators involved in harvest and post-harvest activities can recognize FCM damage and know what to do when they find it. Have procedures in place in the field and packhouse to inspect for FCM presence and damage at all capsicum handling, packing and storage sites. This involves visual checks and slicing fruits open to check for FCM larvae. Slicing a minimum of two fruit for every 100 is recommended. Initiate the FCM alert system and put intervention and isolation procedures in place when FCM infested fruit is identified. Maintain a system for keeping records of packhouse inspections. Ensure practices and facilities are in place for the management of all capsicum waste, including pest-damaged fruit. Use refrigerated storage facilities where possible. And have a traceability system in place and ensure that each lot is identified and maintained separately throughout all post-harvest operations. The methods that we are uh, using currently in Kenya are effective, but uh, oh, something to note is that most growers have not been placing their pheromone traps or delta traps strategically as is required. I think with a lot of awareness and training, uh, we are able to do a lot of intervention in the production sites, that's the greenhouses, so that uh, we reduce the incidence of the pest uh, getting to the next uh, stage, which is the pack house.